All right. Hopefully we can begin now. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'd start by introducing myself. Uh, my name is uh, Brian Wood. Uh, I work at the Naval Re Research Laboratory in, in Washington, D.C. Um, so uh, I, I, I do both observational astrophysics and observational solar physics. Um, so in, in terms of astrophysics, I'm interested in, in uh, the atmospheres of cool main sequence stars and, uh, and the interstellar medium. And in terms of uh, solar physics, I'm mostly interested in coronal mass ejections, uh, especially observations of CMEs uh, from uh, uh, the stereo spacecraft. Um, so even though I'm currently at NRL, uh, I'm very familiar with Boulder. Um, uh, I was an undergraduate at the University of Colorado. I was a graduate student at the University of Colorado. And uh, later, I, was, I even had an extended postdoc here as well. Um, so my, my thesis advisor at the University of Colorado was Jeff Linsky. And, and Jeff and I have actually worked together on the, the, the book chapter and on this lecture. So I'll be giving the first half uh, of the lecture, and, and Jeff will be giving the, the, the second part. Um, so we're going to be talking about stellar winds and their interaction with the interstellar medium. So my part, I'll be talking about astrospheric and heliospheric evolution associated with, with solar and stellar wind evolution. And in specific, specifically, I've listed four specific things that I'll be talking about. I'll introduce basic heliospheric structure. Um, I'll discuss how we can detect uh, stellar winds and or astrospheres around other stars, uh, and how we infer wind evolution uh, from the astrospheric uh, data. Um, and if I have time, I'll get into uh, planetary implications for the wind uh, evolution. Uh, and, uh, and if I don't have time, I, I, I think other speakers here will be dealing with that topic as well. Um, so after the, the break, Jeff will be talking more about the interstellar medium uh, and how ISM variability is, uh, affects astrospheric and heliospheric evolution. OK, so the, the natural place to start when talking about stellar winds interacting with the interstellar med medium is, is to discuss our basic understanding of how the wind of our own star uh, interacts with the interstellar medium. Uh, the, st the solar wind interstellar uh, interaction defines the uh, large scale structure of, of, of our heliosphere, um, defines the, the, the boundary between the region of space carved out by the solar wind and our galactic environment, if you will. Uh, so this is a hydrodynamic model of, of, of the global heliosphere. So the, so the solar wind is expanding radially from the sun's position here. Um, the sun is moving with respect to the interstellar medium, so the sun sees a flow of interstellar material from the right in this figure. Um, so uh, the interstellar medium is, is partly ionized and partly neutral. So, um, so the top panel is showing the, the plasma temperature, and the bottom panel is neutral hydrogen density. So the, the solar wind expands until its ram pressure drops to that of the interstellar medium. And at that point, it is shocked to slower speeds at this termination shock. Um, the interstellar wind also possibly encounters a shock on its way towards the heliosphere. Uh, there's actually a, a vigorous debate uh, in the heliospheric community about whether the bow shock exists or not. Um, uh, I discussed that a bit in the book chapter. I won't talk about that much here. Um, in between the termination shock and the bow shock, there is a third discontinuity called the heliopause. Uh, the heliopause divides the plasma flows of the interstellar plasma and the, and the solar wind. So the, uh, the, the plasmas of the solar wind and the, the heliosphere and the interstellar medium don't mix. Uh, the, the, the interstellar plasma is deflected around the heliosphere like that and the solar wind is deflected backwards into this long heliotail in the downwind direction. Um, so there are two spacecraft, two important spacecraft, that are directly exploring uh, the characteristics of the global heliosphere. Those are the two Voyager spacecraft, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. And the, the rough trajectories are shown on this, this, this figure. Uh, these spacecraft were launched way back in 1977, uh, back before most of you were even born, I'm sure. Um, so these are now the most distant man-made objects in the universe. Voyager 1 is 128 astronomical units away. That's, that's roughly four times the distance to Neptune, so way out there. So far out, it takes 18 hours for a signal from Voyager 1 to travel back to Earth, traveling at the speed of light. Um, so, uh, so Voyager 1, uh, in 2004, Voyager 1 crossed the termination shock at a distance of uh, uh, 94 astronomical units from the sun. Um, in, in 2007, Voyager 2 crossed the termination shock. 
um, at a distance of 84 AU. Um, a couple years ago, Voyager 1 started seeing particle signatures that uh, many uh, lead many to believe that Voyager 1 has actually now crossed the heliopause. Um, so uh, that's exciting because if Voyager 1 has indeed crossed the heliopause, it is uh, essentially mankind's first true interstellar probe. Because once you cross the heliopause, you're surrounded by a plasma that is fundamentally interstellar in nature and not solar wind. Um, OK, so enough about the Voyagers. Uh, let's get back to talking about the neutrals, which I'll, I'll be talking a lot about in this talk. So unlike the plasma, the, the neutrals in the interstellar medium are able to pen penetrate into the uh, inner heliosphere. Uh, the neutrals interact uh, in, within the heliosphere primarily through, through charge exchange reactions. So charge exchange is a relatively simple process where we have a neutral atom that interacts with an ion and an electron jump changes partners. It jumps from the neutron to the ion. So for example, you have a, a neutral hydrogen atom and encounters a, a proton, and the electron from the formerly neutral hydrogen uh, atom jumps to the, to the proton. Um, so, but to but uh, the mean free paths for these reactions are large enough that, that you can actually get interstellar neutrals uh, uh, permeating this entire region, and charge exchange uh, with, in different parts of the heliosphere can create different populations of neutrals, and that has important observational consequences, which I'll, I'll now discuss. So this is a schematic uh, picture of, of our heliosphere with the interstellar flow uh, now coming from the left. Um, so I've already talked about uh, the Voyager spacecraft and how they're exploring the, the global heliosphere. The other important NASA mission that's, that's, that's uh, currently studying the global heliosphere is, 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 is IBEX, uh, the Interstellar Boundary Explorer. Um, so IBEX orbits the Earth, but it, it, it studies the global heliosphere by observing energetic neutral atoms streaming from the outer heliosphere. And it can make maps of, of those energetic new, neutral atoms. So the primary population of, of, of energetic atoms, neutral atoms, that IBEX was designed to study is, is, is created by two separate charge exchange processes, two, two separate charge exchange interactions, which, which I'll now describe. So uh, an interstellar neutral can penetrate inside the termination shock, charge exchange with a solar wind uh, proton that essentially creates a solar wind neutral and an inflowing interstellar proton, which is then picked up by the solar wind um, uh, and, and it's taken out with it. And, and these pickup ions uh, uh, create a superthermal particle population within the, the, the solar wind. Uh, uh, and this energetic particle population is energized even further when it hits the termination shock. Um, so after you, it goes through the termination shock, this, this really energized pickup ion pop population uh, can charge exchange again with, with, with uh, an, an interstellar neutral that happens to be passing by. And this creates this population of energetic neutrals, some of which can be directed back to the inner heliosphere. And this is what IBEX ob observes. Um, so this so-called distributed component of, of energetic neutrals is what IBEX was designed to study. It's, it's a remote diagnostic of the plasma properties in this region outside the termination shock. Um, so Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 only kind of provide point probes for, for, for the uh, properties in, in two particular locations. Um, IBEX provides a more global picture uh, of, of the, uh, the, the uh, inner helio sheath. Um, so Voyager and IBEX are kind of uh, complementary in that respect. But, uh, interstellar boundary explorer? It's in Earth orbit. It's a highly elliptical orbit. It needs to be in a highly elliptical orbit to carry it out of the magnetosphere. So I think it goes almost uh, most of the way towards the moon, actually. Uh, so yeah, it was launched in uh, 2009, I believe, and, so, and it's still operating. So, so yeah, the Voyager uh, and, and IBEX are, the, I think, the two big um, uh, NASA missions that are focused on, on studying the global heliosphere. Um, Uh, it, oh, it's still contentious. Yes, yes, yes. Trust me. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Um, right, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, the question was um, it, it has the question of whether there's a bow shock around the, 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 uh, the heliosphere 
um, been resolved? And, and, the, and the, answer, the short answer is no. <laughs> Could do a whole lecture on this. So. <laughs> but no, it's still very contentious. So these are the ENAs that IBEX was designed to observe. But, but when IBEX started taking data in 2009, it observed something else as well, something that was not expected. It observed a ribbon of, of energetic neutral atoms um, that completing almost a full circle in, in, in the sky. Um, and so the source of this ribbon of energetic neutrals is still somewhat of a mystery. Uh, we don't know exactly where they're coming from. I think it is, is commonly believed by almost everyone that it has to have something to do with the orientation of the inter interstellar magnetic field. Uh, the, the orientation of the interstellar field is the only thing that provides a preferential axis on which you could build something like this. Um, so the idea is that you have an interstellar field that, that alters the shape of the heliosphere uh, somewhat, and somehow that leads to uh, 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 ENAs coming from a plane uh, perpendicular to the interstellar uh, field direction. Um, and whether that this emission, this, these ENAs are being produced at the termination shock or the inner heliosheath in between the termination shock and heliopause or the heliopause or the outer heliosheath beyond the heliopause is, 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 is still uncertain at this point. Um, so that's an active area of research. Um, so an, another currently operating spacecraft that uh, can be used to study uh, interstellar neutrals is the Hubble Space Telescope. And this now gets into uh, work that I'm heavily involved with. Um, and, and specifically, the, the, the relevant Hubble data is, is, is UV spectra of stellar lime and alpha lines. Um, so when you observe a spectrum of a stellar lime and alpha line, you always observe, you get, always get something that looks like this. Um, so the intrinsic stellar lime and alpha profile should look something like this, with a self-reversal in the middle. The solar lime and alpha profile looks something like that. Um, but this, this, even for the nearest stars, uh, the Lyman alpha profile is, is mutilated by lots of absorption uh, by hydrogen and deuterium in between us and the star. Um, so this big broad uh, absorption and, and this absorption in the wings too is, is due to hydrogen uh, in between us and the star. Uh, this little dip here, that's due to deuterium uh, in between us and the star. So most of this absorption, uh, most of this material is interstellar material. Um, um, but a detailed analysis of this line profile shows that at least in some cases, you see excess absorption on, on the right side of the line um, that cannot be interstellar. Um, and in, in some cases, you'll see excess on the left side um, that cannot be uh, interstellar. So the excess on the right side is heliospheric absorption, specifically uh, heliospheric absorption caused by neutrals created by charge exchange beyond the heliopause, in what has been called uh, the hydrogen wall. Uh, in between the bow shock and heliopause. Um, and as this figure kind of suggests, we only see this absorption in upwind directions. We do not see it in downwind directions. Um, so what is the, uh, the, the absorption on the, on the left side? Uh, well, that's the astrospheric analog. That's the hydrogen wall around the observed star. So if we can observe absorption surrounding the, uh, the sun, you, you might expect we should be able to observe it around the star, too. Yes. Before taking data like this, uh, next, next time. <laughs> right, right. Jeff will be talking uh, about. Uh, yeah, the question was, how would we know the um, the amount of interstellar material between us and the star? Um, yeah, Jeff will be talking a lot more about in, interstellar uh, stuff uh, uh, in, in the next talk. So I'll defer to him. <laughs> okay. So the importance of this astrospheric hydrogen wall absorption, uh, you know, the astrospheric. Uh, the corresponding astrospheric version of this is that this is the only, currently the only way we have to observationally study solar-like stellar winds and solar-like astrospheres. Uh, there is no other way, and so uh, a lot of this talk will be devoted to this 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 absorption. Okay, so we are, the question is, why, why is the heliospheric absorption on the right side and the astrospheric on the left side? So we are observing the heliospheric absorption from inside the heliosphere. 
we are observing the astrospheric absorption from outside the heliosphere. So the Doppler shift works in opposite ways. It shifts, uh, it shifts the heliospheric absorption one way and the astrospheric absorption one way. Ultimately, you know, as, as the interstellar absorption you know, enters the hydrogen wall region, it's decelerated and deflected. And so for the heliospheric case, that, that ends up being a, a red shift. And for the astrospheric case, it's, it, it's a blue shift because our perspective is reduced. We're seeing it from outside instead of inside. So it's a Doppler shift effect. All right, there's one last Lyman alpha uh, diagnostic that I thought I'd show, and that's that in very downwind directions, you see a different Lyman alpha uh, absorption, uh, very, very broad and very shallow. Um, and this is due to a population of, of, of neutrals in the heliosphere caused by charge exchange between the termination shock and heliopause. So this population is, is formed by charge exchange outside the heliopause. Uh, this, this population of, of neutral hydrogen is formed by uh, uh, charge exchange uh, in between the termination shock and heliopause. And it's only in very, very downwind directions with long path legs down the heliotail that, that you get enough column density to see absorption from this uh, component. Um, so in some, I would argue this is the first detection of the heliotail. But uh, when I talk about heliospheric and astrospheric absorption after this, it will all be of the hydrogen wall of your variety. Uh, yes. But the astrosphere. A astrosphere is the stellar analog of this. So there, the star is there instead of the sun. Excuse me? Whatever star you're observing, yes. So, so this is a, an observation of, the, of a Lyman alpha line from a star called Alpha Sin. Um, and so our line of sight to that star passes through the interstellar medium. It passes through our own heliosphere, and it passes through the stellar astrosphere. And so you can get absorption from all three. And disentangling them is, is not easy, but uh, I would argue it can be done. Yes? Uh, well, it, there, there's a flow. I mean, so so that there's the there's if 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 the if there was no interstellar flow and 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 then the the the, uh, the the solar wind was just sitting there, then you would get an expanding bubble, basically. Yeah, but the question is, why would you have this flow on the other side? Oh, uh, well, yeah. So imagine that. Uh, so imagine that uh, the interstellar medium is just like the, the, the air in this room. It's just sitting there, and, and, and the sun is moving through it. So, 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 it's, uh, so, so you see, see a flow from one direction. You don't see anything from the other direction. Uh -huh. yeah. OK. OK, well, uh, so, so that's, that, that thus ends my, my introduction, introduction to basic heliospheric structure and, uh, and my introduction to how the Voyager spacecraft, IBEX, and Hubble Space Telescope are studying the heliosphere. But the topic of this talk is beyond just the heliosphere. It's, it's also about astrospheres. Yes? Yeah, there is one more solar system. Yes. Yes, Cassini also observes a band of energetic neutral atoms stretching across the sky, which is different than this, and that's because it's a higher particle energy. Um, uh, uh, Cassini observes that higher energetic neutral particle energies than Ibex does, and so the, the characteristics of the, the, the ribbon are, are different. Uh, yeah. OK, so astrospheres. So, uh, so I've described how we discuss, discuss the, do, uh, explore the heliosphere. Um, how can we explore astrospheres around other stars? Um, well, I've mentioned one way. There's the Lyman alpha absorption diagnostic, which I'll certainly be coming back to. But uh, can't we just image astrospheres? Uh, uh, in some cases, the answer is yes. And here are some examples of images of astrospheres uh, for different types of stars. So, so for example, uh, this is a, a, a very young star, newly born star with a strong wind interacting with the, the high density nebula from which the, the, the star just formed. I think this, this image is on the, the cover of your heliophysics books. Um, so there are a couple examples of, of red supergiant winds interacting with the interstellar medium, uh, 
two famous stars, Myra, a famous variable star, and, and Betelgeuse, the brightest star in Orion. Um, so you see the wind ISM interactions uh, for, for those. This is a massive hot star interacting uh, with, with uh, the interstellar medium. And finally, this is a pulsar bow shock. Uh, pulsars don't have high mass loss rates, but, but they're relativistic. So they're really fast and really energetic. And so you can get uh, 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 visible astrospheres around pulsars. But uh, none of these stars or stellar winds is, is much like the sun or much like the solar wind at all. These are much uh, stronger stellar winds, um, much different types of stars than the sun. Uh, the, unfortunately, we just cannot detect the astrosphere of a sun-like star uh, in, in such a manner. Yes. Oh, dear. Um, let's see. This, I, I, think, I think these are all infrared. I could be wrong. But I, I think this is H-alpha, optical H-alpha. Uh, this, is, this is an oddball. This is ultraviolet image taken by a spacecraft called Galax. Uh, I think it's almost unique uh, in being able to observe uh, an astrosphere in the ultraviolet. That's not normal. Uh, yes? Oh dear. Uh, so that's there. Uh, I think this is. So the star looks. Oh, this it's overexposed. It's it's overexposed. So yeah, the star is never resolved. Uh, so these are. Yeah, I think this is. There is a. I mean, there's 15. Is that arc seconds or arc minutes? I, I, I think this is all. This is big. I think this is arc minutes, uh, and these don't have a scale to them, um, but. Uh, yeah. It, it has to be overexposed in order to, to visualize yes. the, the Sure, sure. <laughs> I'm asking. I'm asking. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So the stellar winds themselves uh, of solar like stars are, are extremely difficult to detect. Uh, for the more massive winds, uh, they provide nice spectroscopic diagnostics. So this is the uh, this is, a, this is, a, this is the uh, line profile of, of a line observed from a, from a hot, uh, massive star. And this big, broad absorption that you see is from the stellar wind. And it's blue shifted from the, the, the rest frame of the line. So the blue shift tells you roughly the, the wind velocity. The amount of absorption uh, tells you roughly the, the, the wind mass loss rate. So there's a lot of information there in, in, in line profiles like this. And likewise, this broad absorption feature is from the wind of this red giant star, Aldebaran is, is, is its uh, proper name. Um, unfortunately, the solar wind and solar white winds around other stars provide no such nice diagnostics. And uh, the basic problem can be uh, perceived here in this table, comparing uh, typical stellar wind properties for these different types of stars, including hot, uh, uh, massive stars, o, o and B type stars, and red supergiants and red giant stars, and finally, the solar wind. So the, the, the properties that are listed here are ionization temperature, typical wind velocity, typical mass loss rate, and typical characteristic densities at 1 AU and at the, and at the, the stellar surface. And so the mass loss rate, rate of the solar wind and its characteristic densities are just orders of magnitude less than these other types of winds. So that just makes it much harder to detect uh, an analog for the solar wind around another star. Uh, we don't have any nice spectroscopic diagnostics like this to go on. Um, it's at the, at the, the, the stellar surface, yep. yep. And by the way, I... Uh, um, if I talk about O and B type stars, uh, how many of you do not know what I'm talking about? Uh, okay. Yeah, this is, my background is astronomy, so, so I just take this stuff for granted. I, have, I, uh, I, mean, I majored in uh, astrophysics, so that's got my PhD in it. So, but I realize that a lot of you are, are, are come from a more solar physics background and aren't, aren't familiar with these, 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 these spectral types. So O and, o and B type stars are very hot, massive stars. Okay, if you think about it, the solar wind itself isn't terribly easy to detect or study remotely. Uh, so this, this figure shows um, some, some ways that we, we study the, the solar wind. Um, so the, the aurorae and, and the behavior of comet tails were the first two indications um, that uh, there were, was a particle flow from the, uh, the sun. Um, 
These days, we can use coronagraphic imaging uh, to, to reveal the corona, and we can see mass streaming away from the sun and then proceed the solar wind that way. And of course, obviously, we have spacecraft that operate directly within the, the, the solar wind, and we can observe its properties directly. But none of these mechanisms that, that we use to study the solar wind can, applied to, can be applied to detecting analogous winds around other stars. Um, so one of the reasons why we would want to detect winds around other stars is if, if we can detect um, winds around stars of different ages and activity levels, we can figure out how winds evolve with time. Uh, we can figure out what, the, what the, the solar wind has been doing during the course of its four and a half billion year lifetime. Um, so what was the solar wind like three billion years ago? Well, if we could ob uh, observe the, solar wi the, the wind of a, a, a young solar-like star that's three billion years younger than the sun, then, then that could tell us. Um, so we know a lot. So let me back up. So uh, the solar wind arises from the solar corona. I mean, the solar wind, the existence of the solar wind can be understood most simply as simple thermal expansion from this hot corona. Um, so this is, these are X-ray images of the, of the sun um, from, well, EUV images of the sun from a solar max period and a solar minimum period. So, uh, so you can study stellar corona by uh, observing stars in X-rays. And we know a lot about uh, how um, <clears throat> uh, stellar coronal X-ray emission evolves with time for, for, for sun-like stars. And that's what this figure is showing. So this figure shows uh, the evolution of, of, of coronal X-ray and EUV flux as a function of age uh, for very sun-like stars. The sun is there. Um, and you can see that, that the X-ray coronal activity declines with time, declines with age um, for sun-like stars. So the basic idea here is that stars begin their lives rotating very rapidly. Uh, this rapid rotation in, induces a, a creates a strong magnetic dynamo in the stellar interior. Uh, so that creates a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, magnetic activity on the surface and therefore a lot of uh, X-ray and EUV emission. So stars begin th their lives uh, uh, very bright in X-rays and very coronally active. Um, but with time, stellar rotation slows with time because the, the, the magnetic field of the star will drag against the wind of the star and slowing the, st the, the, the rotation with time. Therefore, the dynamo weakens and therefore the, the coronal activity weakens. Um, so that's the, the, the basic idea here for why coronal activity dec declines with time. But the, the, the big question is, what does this mean for the stellar wind? Uh, does this mean that the solar wind, uh, th does this mean that the winds of solar-like stars uh, also behave in a similar manner or not? Um, and specifically, what does it mean for what the solar wind was like you know, four billion years ago? Uh, we know from the stellar data that it was more coronally active, but does that mean that its wind was, was, was much stronger in the distant past? Um, so uh, you can argue multiple ways. Uh, so the case for a very strong wind from the young sun. So we know that the young sun was, was, was coronally very active, very bright in X-rays, uh, rapidly rotating. Um, uh, because there was more material heated to coronal temperatures, you might think, oh, that means more material available to expand into a wind. Uh, therefore, you'd expect uh, the young sun to have a strong wind. Um, furthermore, young stars are also known to be uh, frequent flares and, and, and with flares much more energetic than, than flares that we see from the sun. On the sun, the energetic flares are accompanied by coronal mass, mass ejections. And one might imagine that the, the more frequent flaring could lead to a wind that's dominated by, by, uh, coronal, by material and coronal mass ejection uh, associated with the, with the flares. So that's another argument uh, for there being a strong wind from the sun that could be CME dominated. This figure here is from uh, an attempt to take the solar flare energy uh, coronal mass ejection mass relation seen for the sun and extrapolating it to younger, more active, more frequently flaring stars to infer how the, how the CME mass loss rate uh, should change uh, with, with X-ray luminosity and therefore with age, uh, essentially. And the suggestion is, yeah, you get orders of magnitude, stronger mass loss rates just due to uh, CME mass loss alone. So these, this seems to be a strong argument in favor of a strong wind for, for the young sun. But you can also make the opposite argument. Uh, so uh, during the course of the solar activity cycle, uh, the solar X-ray flux varies by quite a bit. Um, so 
The question is, does that mean the solar wind varies by quite a bit over the course of an activity cycle? And the answer is no. And that's what these, these three plots are, 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 are showing. So if you yeah, plot uh, mass loss rate versus X-ray flux, there's just no relation whatsoever. Um, and, and Voyager 2 has been monitoring the solar wind for you know, 30 years, and there's no clear activity cycle uh, variation. So this is a case for there, this is an argument for there being no relation at all between uh, uh, X-ray emission, coronal activity, and stellar wind strength. You could also make a case for there being an anti-correlation between uh, coronal activity and, and stellar wind strength. Uh, one problem with the argument from the previous slide is that coronal X-ray emission comes from closed magnetic field regions. It comes from coronal loops. The wind comes from open magnetic field regions. So one could imagine that if you had a really, really active star, uh, it would be completely covered by closed magnetic fields, and there wouldn't be any room for any open magnetic fields, and therefore no room for the, for the, the, the wind to escape. So that's an argument for an anti-correlation uh, between uh, the, uh, the, the coronal activity and, and winds. So the bottom line here is, is, is uh, without guidance from observations, we really don't know very much. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, this plot. So this is these are actual mass loss rates measured at 1 AU by spacecraft uh, observations. These are observations, and this is X-ray fluxes from the GOES. I think you know, this is over paper actually. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so this is your, after, after, your afternoon speaker. Is a, <laughs> this is his work. Um, so these are X-ray. So these are both observational things. Um, so and. and and Ofer was looking for a, a correlation between the two and found nothing. Uh, so what's, oops, uh, so what's here is, is so, so this is an attempt to, uh, you know, this is more complicated. So this is, a, we know how, for, for on the sun, the relation between flare energy and mass of coronal mass ejection. And so that creates some power law relation between those things. Now, we know flare rate for, for stars and flare energy. We have some flare distribution for, for the stars, for, for more active stars. So can, if you extrapolate the solar flare CME relation to more active stars with more frequent flaring rates, we, you can get at what their mass loss rate from CMEs should be. Um, so. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right, <laughs> right, yeah. Yes, Rachel. Does the fraction of the solar wind that occurs in the appears in the slow and fast solar wind change with time? You you would certainly think so. I, um, oh, do you want to answer that, Ofer? Oh uh, no, th this 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 is for. I mean, I mean, this data, this mass loss rates were taken from one AU. I don't know from wind or or, or, or ACE or, or. And this this upper ones are from 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 Ulysses. This is from high latitudes, and this is from near Earth. All right. So the bottom line from all this was that we really do need observations of stellar winds to tell us uh, what they're doing. Uh, and this brings us back to the astrospheric uh, Lyman alpha absorption diagnostic, which uh, at the moment is the only game in town. Uh, so this figure from the book chapter shows what happens to the stellar Lyman alpha profile as it travels from the start of the sun. You get absorption from the astrosphere, from the interstellar medium, and from our own heliosphere. And the bottom line is something that looks like this, uh, which I showed before, um, with where most of this absorption, both from hydrogen and deuterium, is from the interstellar medium. But there is an excess on, on in this case, both sides of the line. Uh, the excess on the, writ, on the, the right side is, is heliospheric absorption. And the excess from the, the, on the left is, is astrospheric absorption, uh, which can be used as a diagnostic of the stellar wind. And yes. Mm -hmm. If they're in the same direction, yes. It, it. Okay, so, so the question was, do you expect 
the, the amount of heliospheric absorption to be the same for all observed stars? And the answer is yes, if it's in the same direction. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, the amount of heliospheric absorption that you observe will depend on, on where it is relative to the heliospheric structure. And you really only see this absorption strongly in upwind directions. Uh, that's where the, the, it's easiest to see. Okay. All right, so this is, this is so the, the, the Lyman Alpha data that I've been showing you is, is for Alpha Centauri. Um, which is a binary, two stars, Alpha Cent A and Alpha Cent B. This is the closest star system to us, only 1.3 parsecs away, about four light years. Um, but there's a very distant companion to, to the Alpha Cent system called Proxima Cent. It's a teeny weeny little M dwarf star. Um, uh, not much bigger than Jupiter. Anyway, so this, the, 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 the green line here is, is the Alpha Cent data again. The, the dashed line is the ISM absorption. So once again, you see the excess absorption on both sides of the line profile. In red is overplotted the, the Lyman alpha profile of Proxima Cent. Uh, notice that, and this gets to your question, you see the exact same heliospheric absorption for, for Alpha Cent and Proxima Cent. Yeah, they're in the same direction. And, uh, so, so yes, you see the same absorption. But the, true, the same is not true where the astrospheric absorption is. The excess absorption that you see towards Alpha Cent is not observed at all towards Proxima Cent. Um, so let's demonstrate, you know, Proxima Cent really is far away. It's like 10,000 AU away. This, this demonstrates that this excess absorption is due to circumstellar absorption around Alpha Cent that doesn't extend as far as, as the distant companion Proxima Cent. And this also suggests that the Alpha Cent must have a stronger wind than Proxima Cent to create a larger astrosphere, a thicker hydrogen wall, and more absorption. And so this points the way towards how the amount of astrospheric absorption that you observe can be a diagnostic for wind strength. Okay, so both the, these, these Alpha Cent and Proxima Cent, if, if, if the stars had very different vectors, you'd be, you'd be absolutely correct. They could, in principle, be different. But Proxima Cent and Alpha Cent are, are a, they're a, they're, they're a, they're a, they're all, they're a system. So they have the same space motions. Um, and so they see the same interstellar flow. So, so the geometry is the same in this case. Yes. Uh, well, uh, well, I haven't even gotten to the, the, the actual measurements yet. Uh, that, that's my next slide. Let me come back to that. Um, so in order to actually quantify what the mass loss rate is, um, you, you do need assistance from, from models of the astrosphere like this. Um, so this is four models of, of the, astrosphere, the Alpha Cent astrosphere, with, assuming four different mass loss rates, ranging from 0.2 times the, the solar mass loss rate up to twice the solar mass loss rate. Naturally, as you increase the mass loss rate, uh, the astrosphere gets bigger, the hydrogen wall gets thicker, that's the red region, um, and therefore the amount of absorption that you predict uh, from, from, from the astrosphere increases. Um, so for all these nearby stars, we know what their space motion vector is very well. We know what their proper motion is, their radial velocity. We know basically what the interstellar flow vector is. So we can compute what interstellar flow velocity each star sees in its rest frame and take that into account in this kind of modeling. Uh, we also know what our line of sight is through the structure. In, in this case, it's about 79 degrees from the upwind direction. So using these models, we can get predicted absorption for, for the appropriate direction. And this is the same figure as I showed earlier, uh, but now uh, I, I also show the, prediction, the predicted astrospheric absorption of those four models. And the model with twice the solar mass loss rate uh, fits the, the Alpha Cent data uh, reasonably well. And uh, the model with 0.2 uh, it represents kind of an upper limit for Proxima Sen. And to get to your question of, of what kind of uncertainties uh, I would uh, attach to these, at least a factor of two kinds of uncertainties uh, because of these uncert the assumptions that you have to make in, in this kind of modeling. I'd be thrilled with factor of two uncertainties. <laughs> or Rachel. So what other parameters you basically have to assume Right, so, so the first task that you have to do when you get into this game is you have to develop a heliospheric model that you know reproduces the heliospheric absorption because this is a case where you know what the input parameters should be. And then, so okay, you've got a model that, that if you assume a, a mass loss rate of one, it can reproduce uh, the heliospheric absorption. Uh, and then you just uh, keep the interstellar parameters the same. You have to assume that the interstellar medium is, 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 is similar between where the sun is to where the star is. So that's, that's one assumption. 
Um, what? Well, it, it, it's hard to quantify, but uh, I mean, one argument in its favor is that the interstellar medium, this is kind of venturing into just territory again, but, but uh, the interstellar medium is supposed to be in pressure equilibrium. And so there could be different ionization fractions within you know, the, these local neutral clouds. Um, but uh, it should have roughly the same pressure. And if it has roughly the same pressure, you should get similar results. And we have done some testing uh, about that. but. Uh, uh, what the, I, I didn't understand the question. Sure, sure. I mean, yeah. I mean, the 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 sun exists within a region of space called the local bubble, and now we're really venturing into Jeff territory. But uh, nevertheless, so uh, the local bubble stretches for maybe a hundred per second, hundred parsecs. In, in, in all directions. And most of the volume of the local bubble is supposed to be fully ionized. Um, and if you have an interstellar medium that's fully ionized, you shouldn't detect any astrospheric absorption at all, because there's no neutrals to, to create uh, such a thing. Um, so, but if you do detect astrospheric absorption, the assumption, the implicit assumption that we're making is that it's due because there is a cloud somewhat similar to the one that surrounds, surrounds the sun surrounding the star as well. So that's the implicit assumption. Exactly what kind of errors that, that translates to in this kind of, it's hard to quantify. Because how do you define what a reasonable assumption is for, for, for the, the cloud? OK. <laughs> so. Uh, we can do this exercise for all stars with, with detected uh, astrospheric absorption. Um, and these are some examples. Um, uh, the, the one point I wanted to make in this slide is that these are the models of those six, six uh, uh, astrospheres. Um, and these can be quite big. Uh, the epsilon area astrosphere, epsilon area is only three parsecs away. Um, and the astrosphere is thousands of AU big. And it's comparable to the size of the full moon in the night sky if you could see it. So this gets to the, there was a question about how big these things can be. So they can be quite big. <laughs> um, OK, I, I, I won't get into that. Uh, this is a list of all the astrospheric measurements that, that, that we made. Um, and yes? The absorption, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, well, it's the wind parameters that matter. Uh, it's only the wind parameters that matter. Um, what we do is, is we vary the assumed um, density of the stellar wind. Another uncertainty that it goes into this is that uh, we assume that the velocity of, of the wind is, is, is the same as the solar wind. Uh, one hand-waving argument in favor of this is, is that observationally, if you look at different types of stellar winds, the wind speeds that you see for different types of stellar winds tend to be close to the surface escape speed, no matter what type of wind you're talking about. Red giant, red supergiant, uh, hot OB star, um, solar winds, escape speed is 600 kilometers per second, which is you know, a reasonable for estimate for the stellar wind. So, so the assumption, is, so that's another assumption that gets made. Those are the two things that matter. It's the RAM pressure that matters. That's rho v squared. So it's density and velocity. It's actually density that we're varying. Uh, but we could do velocity, too, in principle. But, but I explained the reason why we, we, we do density. Um, so this is the full list. Um, and as I talked about earlier, so these are the mass loss rates that, that we've measured for these, these stars. And I'm going to focus on the, the solar light main sequence stars. Uh, and uh, these are X -ray, coronal X-ray luminosities for these stars. And for, for, for the reasons I talked about before, since, since coronal winds arise from stellar coronae, one might expect there to be some relation between x-ray and, and, and mass loss rate. And if you plot um, uh, mass loss per unit surface area versus x-ray coronal, coronal x-ray surface flux, uh, this is what you get for, for the main sequence stars. Um, so the most solar-like stars are, are shown in red. Uh, teeny weeny little M dwarf stars are, are shown. There's two of them. Uh, those are shown in green. So at least at lower activity levels, you, you seem to see evidence for an increase in, in mass loss rate uh, uh, with coronal activity in a manner consistent with this power law relation here. But there's also su a suggestion that something, this, this relation fails at, at some activity level. And 
And uh, uh, one problem is that, that two of the stars in this these high activity regime are these teeny weeny little M dwarfs. And do the teeny weeny little M dwarfs have the should they have the same relation as the more solar like G and K dwarfs? Uh, uh, debatable. Um, Piwanuma, however, is an excellent young sun analog. Uh, basically the same spectral type. It's 500 million years old, uh, and it ha has a low uh, mass loss rate of only half times solar. This is a very new me measurement, uh, by the way, uh, published this year. Um, Cybo is a binary, uh, and we don't know which of the two stars the wind is coming from. Uh, but what's being noted here is the only way to make Cybo B consistent with the stars that it's similar to in, ter in terms of activity level. Uh, and Cybo A, similar to, consistent with, with the, the star that it's similar to, Piwanuma, is to assign almost all the mass, all, all the wind to Cybo B. So the assumption is that Cybo B is 90%, accounts for 90% of the wind, and Cybo A accounts for 10% of the wind from the binary. Uh, there's no observation, there's no observational way to tell if this, this assumption is correct. Um, so uh, let me skip this. Uh, so at least for the lower activity uh, levels, you have that power law relation between mass loss and X-ray uh, service flux. This can combine uh, with, with relations between X-ray activity and rot stellar rotation, and stellar rotation and stellar age. There's been a lot of work uh, to, to, in the past few decades to determine what these relations are. Um, and, and if you combine these three parallel relations, you can get a, a relation between mass loss and stellar age, uh, m dot proportional to t to the minus 2.33. And this is what that, that suggests for the mass loss rate history of the solar wind. And so I'll end with this. Uh, so the sun currently has a mass loss rate of about 2 times 10 to the minus 14 uh, solar masses per year. And that parallel relation suggests that as you go backwards in time, the solar wind gets stronger and stronger and stronger, up to about uh, 80 times the strength of the current young solar, the current uh, uh, solar wind. Uh, but because the mass loss activity relation is, is truncated, this one is as well. And perhaps this pi one uma uh, measurement is indicative of, of surprisingly low mass loss rates at very early times. Um, so this is this is uh, what we would infer for the, the mass loss evolution uh, for, for solar-like stars based on the astrospheric climate alpha diagnostic. And, I, and I'll stop there and take any more questions. This. Yes, yeah, go ahead. Oh, uh, we don't have any astrospheric detections for brown dwarfs, so. We, we, we barely have enough detections of normal stars. <laughs> but uh, yes, so I don't think we know anything about uh, what the winds of brown dwarfs or astrospheres or brown dwarfs, if they have. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I saw a, a back there. Yeah. So um, in an exercise on the first day, we would It would have to be. Yeah. It could. Let me put it this way: If you had, I mean, stars are generally pretty widely separate. For example, the two Alpha Cent stars, Alpha Cent A and B, we're talking about 20 to 30 AU separation. So that's that's normally the kind of binary separations that we're talking about. And in, in, in the kinds of there were some binary stars there, but but widely separated, not really really close things like like uh, your. You're, you're talking about. I mean, I could imagine if you had two stars close together and they were both contributing equally equal wind, there would be some momentum loss to the, due to the collision, which would cause us to underestimate the strength of, of, of the stellar wind uh, if we do the kind of analysis that, that, that we did. Uh, yeah. No, no, there's probably enough about that. Yeah, that's a, you have a, you know, go, let, I saw you. Okay, so 
so okay, so for the for for hot massive stars, um, there was one. Let's, let's actually go to the figure. My pretty astrosphere figure. Okay, so so this is a hot massive star. So hot stars have have very massive winds driven by radiation pressure. So very fast, thousands of kilometers per second, and it's driven by radiation pressure. So completely different acceleration mechanism for the, for the solar wind. Um, so that's, those are those types of stars. Uh, red giants and super giants, um, and these are super giants. Uh, these have very low surface gravities uh, and very low surface escape speed. So these winds tend to be very slow and very cool. Um, uh, the wind acceleration mechanism is not known very well at all uh, for, for such stars. Um, various alphane wave ideas out there. Uh, but the, the idea is because the surface gravity is so low, I mean, uh, let, let me put it this way. When the sun goes through a Myra phase, it might actually end up swallowing up the Earth. I mean, they expand that much. And so the idea is the surface gravity is so low that, that you can get a lot of material escaping fairly easily, whatever the acceleration mechanism is. So, so red supergiants and giants have relatively cool, slow winds, but they can be quite massive. Um, so this is a young star that's just formed, so it probably still has an accretion disk around it. Uh, and so there, there may be a, a, a contribution to the wind from, from the accretion process somehow. Um, and it's still embedded in the nebula from which it's, it forms. So that's another reason why an astrosphere for, for a star like this might be detectable is because the, the, the ISM density around it is particularly high. The pulsar is really exotic. So do you know, uh, does anyone know what a pulsar is, or, or how many of you know what a pulsar is? Okay, so so you, so you know what it was. So it's it's a rapidly rotating neutron star. So really, so it's something the mass of the sun packed into a, the, the size of a city. Um, so it, so the surface escape speed from a neutron star is you know half the speed of light or something like that. So so the wind from a pulsar wouldn't be very massive, but it's really really fast. And so so it's really energetic. So did I cover the types of stars you're interested in? Or <laughs> okay. uh, yes? So you mentioned that the sum of the massive stars is in dark. Is that a different dimension? The Lyman alpha? Yes, yes, so yes. Can you tell a little bit more about like, how, how maybe another indicators of another hidden level indicators that could help which how we, we could actually detect these? So we, we really would like to have another stellar wind diagnostic. Uh, that, that's certainly true. Uh, the one hope that's kind of on the horizon that people talk about is radio emission. I mean, winds should be source. These are ionized coronal winds. They should be source of free, free emission uh, at some level. Uh, however, current radio t telescopes are only able to give us upper limits that are you know, orders of magnitude higher than the strength of the, sol the, the solar wind. Um, but. Uh, that's, that's kind of the hope, of, to find some other way of, of more directly detecting uh, stellar yeah, winds. I, I'm thinking like, uh, I don't know, maybe if you know the, the, I don't know, the H and K activity level of the star that could be related with the magnetic activity, principle could be connected with it. Oh, we know all, any, any activity diagnostic th of that sort, yeah, we know, we know everything for these well-observed stars. But uh, yeah, it's, it's not the activity diagnostic that's the problem. It's a wind diagnostic that's the problem. That's what we're missing. I mean, these various activity diagnostics like calcium-2 and x-rays, uh, EUV emission, uh, even flare rate or something, these things are all pretty highly correlated. Uh, so so, um, so uh, we know we've got that side of the equation figured out pretty well. Um, but uh, it's the wind side that we're, we're lacking. Uh -huh. Maybe we could ask the, the how many how many of you know what a type two radio burst is? Okay, so type two radio emission comes from when you see a, a very very fast CME uh, uh, from the sun uh, with a shock, and so the the, the emission comes from the shock uh, of a CME. So Jeff is proposing oh we could detect the analog of that around our CME. <laughs> Go 
uh, how, how, how will the, the, the stellar wind affect the evolution of, of magnetospheres? Yes, I mean, that's definitely, you know, I, I mentioned I was going to get into if I had time and I didn't get into the planetary implications. But yes, uh, people are very interested in, in, so, in how solar-like winds evolve with time and how does that affect. Um, yeah, I even have uh, a visualization of, 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 of a star, uh, of a hot Jupiter planet interacting with the, 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 the wind of a star. And so what effect does the evolution of, of the stellar wind have on, on the atmosphere of the planet and on the planet's magnetosphere? To what degree did, can a planetary magnetosphere protect the planet from losing its atmosphere like this artist's conception is, 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 uh, is uh, showing? Um, so yes. Uh, yeah, that's, 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 that question is of interest, but I'm not the best person to talk about, to talk about the planet. Okay, right, great. Yeah, I'll be around today and tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. yeah.